This is the Aston Martin 177. Compared to Vantage and Vanquish, it is a rubbish name, and frankly, the car deserves better, because it is the most powerful and most expensive Aston Martin of all time. At the front is a 7.3-litre V12, making 700 horsepower, which would be remarkable on its own. But it's even more amazing when you discover that this car weighs less than Aston's own V8 Vantage. They ran the 177 prototype up to 220 miles an hour before the driver backed off. According to Aston, it could go even faster. Whether you'd want to is another matter. Firstly, because it costs 1.3 million pounds, and it would be a shame to break it. And secondly, because, well, just look at it. The underneath of the 177 is made from huge, beautiful sheets of carbon fiber, copied from Aston Martin's Le Mans racers. And on top is a hand-beaten aluminium skin made by the same 200-year-old men who've been making Aston Martins since 1913. If only it had a better name. The 1930 Bentley 8-litre could have become one of the world's greatest cars, like the gargantuan Bugatti Royale. But it was launched in London in 1930 with a price of £1,850. Back then, that was a lot. Especially since, at almost exactly the same time, the Great Depression arrived in Europe. As a result, only 100 8-litres were ever made and the car's failure brought Bentley to its knees. Within a year, it was sold to Rolls-Royce. Of those 100, only 78 are left, and every one is unique. This was a time when companies like Bentley sold you the bottom half of a car, the chassis, engine, and wheels, and then left you to find a coach builder for the body and the seats and the roof. So, this car shares its huge 220-horsepower, six-cylinder engine and 21-inch wheels with all the other 8 litres, but the rest, that was always a one-off. On this one, for example, the roof opens down the middle, so when it rains, those on the left could opt to get wet, while those on the right could stay dry. Strangely, it was an idea that didn't catch on, just like the rest of the Bentley 8 litres. A normal BMW 5 Series can be as interesting as travelling to Switzerland to buy some socks. But this isn't a normal 5 Series. This is the brand new BMW M5. Like previous versions of the M5, you wouldn't know it's anything out of the ordinary, unless you're an industrial strength, class 1, ocean-going car bore. There are slightly swollen arches, fractionally bigger air intakes, and a set of subtle vents in the wings. But overall, it looks like the 520 that your dentist drives. And that's always been the genius of M5s, right back to the original of 1985. They may look quiet and unassuming, but they go like a stabbed badger. And this new one should be no exception. Gone is the rather droney V10 from the old M5, and in its place is a 4.4-litre, twin turbocharged V8 making over 550 horsepower. The pointlessly complicated and stupidly annoying gearbox of the old car has gone too, to be replaced by a seven-speed double-clutch flappy paddle system that should make changes as silky as Pierce Brosnan's underpants. So it's as discreet as a Victorian butler, yet it's powerful enough to pop a kidney. It is, in short, another classic BMW M5. Above 155 miles an hour, they stop trying to classify hurricanes. 155 miles an hour is a Category 5, the kind that killed 12,000 burly Texans in 1900. There is no Category 6, because if there was, there'd be nobody left to classify it once it had passed. The Bugatti Veyron will pass through the air 
at 252 miles an hour, so you have some idea of the forces of nature at work here and the reasons why it needs to haul that vast aeroplane wing into the airstream to keep it stable. It's also why it needs 16 cylinders, 8 litres, 4 turbochargers, 10 radiators and 1,000 horsepower. Everything about this car is Category 6. Except, that is, the skill level required to drive it. Your mother could. A flappy paddle gearbox developed by people who develop Formula One gearboxes and a four-wheel drive system developed with some considerable amount of head scratching by rocket scientists means you just get in and drive. And you won't drive anything faster. Anything. Like Concorde and the Saturn V, the Veyron is the furthest its particular engineering avenue will be explored. The men who engineered it are probably working now on hydrogen propulsion. There is no longer a place in the world for a car that will, with a twist of the special extra key required to dial in that hurricane-beating top speed, consume a set of 10,000-pound tyres in just 300 miles. And that makes me sad. If the DeLorean hadn't existed, Tom Clancy would have had to invent it. This wasn't really a car. It was part of a bigger storyline that involved the British government, the Feds, and a silver-haired anti-hero with some extremely odd ideas. The DeLorean itself was perhaps his oddest idea of all. An unpainted stainless steel sports car with gullwing doors and, thanks to a wheezing 130-horsepower Renault engine hanging off the back, almost no performance whatsoever. The DeLorean quickly developed a terrible reputation, and that only got worse when famous American owners got locked inside by the failing electrics. It was a disaster, and production ended before Steven Spielberg made it a time-travelling film star. If you want one now, there's a man in America who can build you a new DeLorean from old parts. But he won't be the real deal until he gets on the FBI most wanted list. If you wanted to win at Le Mans at the end of the 1950s, you needed to be driving one of these. The Ferrari 250 Testarossa wasn't just beautiful, it was frighteningly effective. It dominated the 24-hour race in 1958 and again in 1960. And then, just for good measure, when the opposition thought it could breathe again, it won again in 1961. Its close cousin, the 250 GTO, might be the most valuable car the world has ever seen, but the Testarossa was the one that took the silverware. For all its beauty, the GTO had to make do with class wins, where the Testarossa beat everything. Its name comes from the red paint the engine builders daubed all over its cylinder head because, well, that's the only colour paint they have at Ferrari. Testarossa means red head. And sure enough, its three-litre V12 engine, made by old men in oily workshops with lathes and drills and unfortunate industrial injuries, had a volcanic nature. There is sweat, and blood and a bad attitude in every Ferrari 250 Testarossa. This is the very latest mid-engined V8 Ferrari, the 458 Italia. Pretty, isn't it? And that's not something you can say about many of their efforts from the last few years. The 430 had a front end like a leering idiot. The 348 looked like it had crashed into a Venetian blind showroom. But this looks just right. Its appearance isn't just for show either. Those black fins in the front grille flex under air pressure, so the faster you go, the more they bend out of the way to improve aerodynamics. And there are no engine intakes to spoil the sides because they've been moved underneath the car. So it looks fantastic, and its 4.5 litre, 562 horsepower V8 means it has the guts to punch you repeatedly in the back of the head. But that alone wouldn't be enough. Some of its ancestors have been as incompetent and terrifying 
as having brain surgery performed by a baboon. As it turns out, the 458 is better than that. Much better. In fact, it's a sharp handling, smooth riding, savagely fast masterpiece. Of course, it's not perfect. For some reason, they've put far too many buttons on the steering wheel. The dashboard screens are so complicated they can only be worked by Bill Gates, and personally, I'd still rather have the brutal Mercedes SLS. But I can't deny that the 458 is a great car and a proper, proper Ferrari. This is only the third Ferrari in history to be called a GTO. The first, the 1962 250 GTO, remains the world's most valuable and quite possibly the world's most beautiful car. But its form came from its main function, as a racer. Likewise, GTO number two, the 288 of the 1980s, was also made to go racing, only for the rules to change at the last minute, leaving it with nowhere to race. And now we have this, the third GTO, a slightly softened road-going version of the 599 FXX. It has 670 horsepower and a sense that it's constantly plotting new and exciting ways to physically harm you. But that's not the only reason why I don't much care for this car. The real reason I'm no fan is because the O in GTO means homologation. It means racing. And this 599 will never race, nor was it ever intended to. In essence, then, it's just a lightened, pumped-up version of the car a successful plastic surgeon would drive. You might think Ferraris should be mid-engined, and this one isn't. You might think Ferraris should have V12s, and this one doesn't. It's called the California, and you have to ask, what's the point of it? Certainly, it's not very pretty, and it has literally the worst built-in telephone of any car in the world. Unless, of course, you've always wanted to spend your life accidentally phoning everyone you know whose name starts with A. But on the plus side, it's got a folding metal roof, it's reasonably nice to drive, and it means Ferrari can take money from people who might previously have bought a Mercedes SL, which means they can afford to develop proper, wonderful supercars like the 458. So, you see, the California does have a point after all. In Italy, you don't take the name of the father in vain. So when Ferrari decided to call this car the Enzo, you knew they had something special in mind. Something that would take supercars onto another level of speed, of handling, of fury. Such fury that after three full-bore standing starts, you have to send the car back to Italy for a new clutch. The Ferrari Enzo marked the point at which supercars became like modern fighter jets, demanding complicated electronics to keep them under control. It's computers that keep its six-litre, 660 brake horsepower V12 and flappy paddle gear shift on speaking turns, and its F1-style adjustable suspension on an even footing. The result is a car that's faster around Ferrari's test track than all but their most recent Formula One cars. The Enzo's V12 went on to even greater things in the insane FXX and the psychotic 599 GTO, both cars that need even more men with laptops to keep them under control. But for Ferrari, the Enzo was Genesis. They only made 399 of them, and then the factory built a 400th for a very particular customer, the Pope. That's how special you have to be to have one. Back in 1995, Ferrari had a problem. How could they follow the extreme and extremely wonderful F40? The answer was this, the F50. A road-going Ferrari with the V12 engine from a Formula One car bolted in the back. Except, as it turned out, it didn't feel bolted in the back. It felt bolted to your back. As a result, the abiding memory for anyone who drove an F50 wasn't the ferocious acceleration or the 200-mile-an-hour top speed. 
It was the sense that you'd had a furiously spinning washing machine full of bricks hammering directly into your most sensitive pain receptors. Add in the fact that it liked to bite back in the corners, and what you've got here is actually the recipe for 4.7 litres of total misery. It was a very bad car, and it was ugly. Still, at least it made them try harder with the Enzo. Everyone knows American cars are terrible, and cars from Europe, especially cars from Italy, are better. Better looking, better driving, and usually better sounding. 50 years ago, Henry Ford knew this. That's why he tried to buy Ferrari, and thought he had, until Enzo Ferrari looked down his Roman nose and said, uh, you know what, actually, you can't have it. So, Henry decided to kick Ferrari where it hurt, on the racetrack. He wrote a blank check and told his engineers to build a better racing car and beat Ferrari at Le Mans. And astonishingly, that car, a British chassis with an American engine, the Ford GT40, did just that, four times. This car is not the GT40, but it looks like one and it was made to celebrate Ferrari's humiliation, only this time on the road, not the track. It's the Ford GT, not the GT40, because unlike that car, it's more than 40 inches tall, so Americans could fit into it. But the idea is just the same. A great big V8, a 5.4-litre with a supercharger, and a relatively simple aluminium chassis. 220 miles an hour and, frankly, astonishing handling for a car from America. And movie star looks. I have never driven a car that attracts more attention, and I drove this one a lot because I bought one as remarkably, at the time, there wasn't a Ferrari that was better. And that's only something that happens once every 50 years. Life.